Uh, we have an excellent panel today. Uh, we have Mark, who I'm going to go ahead and introduce from my right. Uh, we have Richard Zaleta, Gold Star Mortgage. We have Sage Gomez from My NHD. And Mark Wu from Allstate Insurance. So I'm going to go uh, jump right in. And I'm going to go, um, I'm going to ask the first question to Sage. Okay, ladies first. What is an NHD? Um, so an NHD stands for a Natural Hazard Disclosure Statement. So it allows a buyer to make an educated decision about a hazard that may be on a property. So it will disclose whether or not a hazard is on your land. It could affect your property. Um, in California, we only have six state mandated disclosures, which consist of specific flood zones, fire zones, and earthquake fault zones. Although we only have six state mandated natural hazards, a uh, natural hazard disclosure will typically give you more than just those six. Thank you, Sage. Oh, before I go into the next question, a little icebreaker. Uh, uh, briefly introduce yourself in case of those that don't know who you are. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sage Gomez with my NHD. I've only been in the business for about six months now. Before that, I had graduated from college. Um, yeah, that's about me. I'm pretty, you know, haven't really started my journey yet. So I'm happy that I get to start my journey with you guys since my brain's not fully developed yet. So, like, I'll develop it with you guys. <laughs> Um, Grand Canyon University, but I went to community college before that. Thank you, Sage. We, we love your affiliate spotlight. <laughs> 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 Thank you. And then Richard Zaleta, uh, please kindly um, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Gold Star Mortgage. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Richard Zaleta. Uh, I've been in the mortgage business way longer than I thought I'd ever be, about 30 plus years. I love what I do. I really do love mortgage. Uh, I like helping people and, and doing what I do. Um, other than that, I <coughs> love the Trojans, fight on SC. I uh, love the Dodgers, kind of depressed they're not in the World Series. Kind of. Uh, I contemplated suicide. <laughs> other than that, um, I'm just here to help. Thank you. Mark Blue, Allstate Insurance. Good morning, everybody. Mark Wu here, um, and I've been an agency owner in San Gabriel for 31 years. Actually, I used to live on Delta Avenue, just a couple blocks down. Graduate of Cal Poly Pomona. Um, 30, 30 years married, and uh, three daughters, and uh, just love uh, providing insurance and pro uh, protecting the assets of, of all my clients. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to go ask the next question. Um, this one's for Richard Zaleta. What is the difference between the APR and the actual interest rate? That's one thing that's always been asked for, you know, when I'm talking to clients, so, you know, what's your APR? <coughs> that is a difficult question because we're more looking at interest rate. The actual interest rate is the cost of borrowing the money. That's what you, get, that's what you make your payments on is the actual rate of what you're borrowing. The APR is actually calculated with uh, the principal uh, broad measure of cost of mortgage. It includes the interest rate plus other costs such as broker fees, discount points, prepaid interest. Everything else that's actually financed into the loan. So you can't really say the APR is the rate. The actual rate is the interest rate because that is what we calculate the mortgage payment at. So when clients ask me, it's hard to determine that until we know what the loan amount is and what the interest rate is. So I'm always going to quote them what the actual interest rate is because that's what they're going to make the payments on. Thank you, Richard. Mark, let me ask you, what are the perils that a home insurance policy normally cover? Okay, when, when an insurance company is talking about perils, it's talking about what can bring destruction. So, what are perils in a normal homeowner policy? They are things like fire, wind, hail, smoke, vandalism, explosion, falling objects. Falling objects could be anywhere from a tree falling in on top of your house, or it could be even a plane engine or ice de-icing coming from a plane. All right. Normal perils that are not covered are, are flood, which is surface water 
coming from outside in and damaging your house, as well as earth movement or earthquakes. Thank you, Mark. Sage, I have another question. Why are NHDs required? Um, so NHDs are required. It became law in 1998. However, as of right now, it's only legally required within the state of California. I believe it's required for your protection because California is a most litigious state. Um, and NHD may limit your ability to develop on a property. It can limit your ability to obtain insurance. And also it can limit your ability to receive assistance after a disaster. So basically it's here for your protection, information, and education. Thank you, Sage. I, I recently found out also that the state of California has more lawyers than all other states combined. <laughs> so. Thank you. Mark, let me ask you, what is the difference between a specified limited policy and one with extended limits? Okay, the question is, what's the difference between specified limit and extended limit policies? This is super important to you guys that own a home because many of, of us or in the industry, not in the industry, I'm sorry, don't realize that, that sometimes what you see on your dwelling coverage isn't what you get. You can get more than it or you can just get up to it. For example, if your home burns down and you have a specified limit policy, if you have $500,000 of coverage on your homeowner policy, the policy is going to go all the way up to that 500000 and it's going to stop there, all right? So that's probably not the type of policy you want to be on. I would recommend you get what we call a, uh, a policy with extended limits. What that means is that the company is going to go and give a percentage above that limit. So that same $500,000, if you have extended limits, a company will go above and beyond that. Some companies out there do 20%. All right, some companies do 25% above that, some companies do 50% above that. What does that mean to you? E essentially, it's up to you as the homeowner to determine how much your house is gonna be cost to replace, all right? We as insurance agents in the field, doesn't matter what company it is, we do our estimate calculations, but it's up to the, the insurers to determine, is that sufficient enough to bill? And this you are seeing with all the destructions of all the homes that are, are, are happening in this past year and last year, where people don't have enough money to rebuild. So using that same example of $500,000, if you had a claim and it cost $650,000 to rebuild and you had a specified limit policy, the policy only pays $500,000, you're going to be short $150,000. Whereas if your policy happens to have extended limits, and let's say you had a 50% extended limit, that policy would pay 1.5 times the 500,000, which would go all the way up to 750,000. So it's gonna pick up that additional cost to rebuild that, that house that costs 650,000 to rebuild. So it's super, super important for you guys to understand what your policy covers and an easy way to do is just ask your agent, hey, what's the maximum the po this policy is going to pay in the event of a covered loss? And that will tell you, all right? Thank you, Mark. Richard, what is the difference between a direct lender and a mortgage broker? This is an interesting question because I have the experience of doing both. I am a direct lender, which means we fund the loans ourselves. When you are a mortgage broker, you are basically a catalyst for sending loans out to different lenders. The biggest difference to me is, as a broker, you really have absolutely no control once that file goes out. You can't really call and talk to anybody at that lender. You cannot communicate with the underwriter. You're at the mercy of whatever they say. Whereas a direct lender, I have the opportunity where I can have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with the underwriter on any file or any problems that they may be having. So we can get things done a little quicker with a little stress. You're dealing with an account executive when you're a broker. That's your only contact with that lender. If the underwriter denies your file, you're done. You can't really go back and try to negotiate with them. With a direct lender, you have a little more leeway. The underwriter can call you, discuss the file, go over it, say, okay, these are what I think we need to change to make the file work. 
and I know that firsthand because I've done both. Thank you, Rich. Sage, who typically, who typically orders the NHD and what? Um, so the listing agent is the person who typically orders the National Hazard Disclosure. You can order it beforehand if you want to be a little bit more proactive. But however, it typically is ordered once it goes into escrow. And the seller is the person that typically pays for it as well. Thank you, Sage. Mark, what is the impact of the wildfires in recent years to insurability of homes in our foothills? Okay, first of all, did it? Do any of you guys realize that two wildfires happened even today? Yes. Yeah. San Bernardino and Orange County started, um, was it midnight? I mean, sometime early morning last night, yeah. So 2017 and 2018, back to back, were the most damaging uh, wildfires in California history and, and impacted uh, insurance company tremendously. They, some of them, I mean, of the wildfires even took out a whole town. Um, and that cost costs a tremendous amount of money. Well, this year started out just, you know, in a pretty bad note in that, I'm sorry, it didn't, this year it didn't start out, but lately there's been a lot of fires from summer on, right? We have had a lot of fires. And what I have seen in my, my 31 years career is the biggest impact ever and that is I am beginning to get calls from agents and, and clients that have been with companies for a while and they're being non-renewed up in our foothills, meaning that their company is saying, hey, we no longer want to insure you. And it's not even that they're close to the, the foothills. Some of them are two, three, four miles away from the foothills. I've seen it as, as low as, as on Foothill Boulevard, you know up and down uh, Altadena, Sierra Madre, Pasadena, all the way down Glendora and whatnot. And so you're going to see that rates are going to be increasing. You're going to see that, that uh, underwriting is going to be much more challenged. So what I have been going around is instructing my realtors uh, when I do my educational classes is to recognize that, that you need to be educating your, your clients that they cannot no longer just assume just because they're with XYZ company that XYZ company is going to insure their their home uh, that they're purchasing, and and just because the seller has XYZ company doesn't mean that they're going to be able to assume the policy from that company because that company might not be still writing. Now now thankfully for you guys, there's a fallback in that um, all agents that are are licensed in California that means insurance agents we can do what we call a California Fair Plan and that will meet the requirements of the lender. So you are able to close. Just know that that is much a, a longer process in, in getting evidence of insurance than it used to be in, in, in past years. So you need to be proactive when it comes to uh, purchasing insurance in our foothills. Thank you, Mark. Next question is for Sage. Um, are NHDs regulated or unregulated? Um, natural hazard disclosures are actually unregulated, even though it is legally required within the state of California, and it is a law. That's why when you see natural hazard disclosure reports, not all of them are written the same. They all kind of look different. It is an unregulated industry. Thank you, Sage. Richard, are interest rates the same for all borrowers? No. <laughs> <laughs> Interest rates are not the same for all borrowers. Um, they're always affected by FICO score, loan to value, whether it's an investment or purchase. The one thing that always happens is I'm working with a client, I quote them a rate, next thing you know they're telling me, hey, well my cousin just bought six months ago and their rate was this. Well, I don't know what your cousin bought. I don't know what his FICO score was. I don't know how much he put down. Those are what affect the interest rates. When you are looking at a purchase loan or a refinance, there's always add-ons to the rate for the risk of that loan. So it's going to be maybe starting at a rate of, you know, three and a half, but with the add-ons, depending on the risk, it could go up to four and a quarter. The more risky the loan, the more add-ons, the higher the rate. Thank you, Richard. Mark. Um, should I recommend my buyers purchase earthquake insurance? I get this asked all the time here, <laughs> and, and we get some laughs here. 
From, from your standpoint, you always should recommend that the buyers buy earthquake insurance. Here's the reason why. If an earthquake happens and they have documentation and it says, my realtor sent me an email and said this house has been standing for 100 years, I don't need earthquake insurance, and guess what happens? An earthquake causes destruction. Guess who they're coming after? They're coming after you guys. So it's always important for you to recommend it. Whether or not they choose to buy it, that's a different story. What is better or a preferred method is when you guys are asked that question, refer them to an insurance professional and let us take the responsibility of telling them whether or not they have to buy it. First of all, know that lenders don't require earthquake insurance. So that's not a requirement. So it is a voluntary option for your buyers to purchase earthquake insurance. But again, I always say from a standpoint of they're not going to have very many good choices when an earthquake happens. For instance, let's just, I'm going to use Richard as an example. Richard has a house, right? And, and it's $500,000. And an earthquake comes and it destroys his house. And he has a loan of $480,000 on his home, all right, right now. If he doesn't have earthquake insurance, do you think he's going to be able to get a second loan on his house to rebuild? No way. Why is it no way? Anybody do hard money loans out there want to give Richard a loan on a 20%, $20,000 equity? Sure. Yeah. There's, there's not. Maybe, maybe, his, maybe a relative and I'll lend him money. So really, the, the ability to borrow again on his house is gone. So the last option is walking away. And that's not a very good option, um, you know, because it messes you up for a while. Is it seven years when you do that? Or I don't recall what the thing is. So earthquake insurance is something that I think, you know, it, it is uh, something we have to deal with here. In the East Coast, they deal with hurricanes. Here we deal with earthquake. I say if you can afford it, get it. And, and even though it costs more than your homeowners, at least so you don't have to worry about it and, and hope you never have to use it. But know that, that it has, in my career, I dealt with Northridge earthquake and, and basically that's when most of the insurance companies uh, decide not to write any more business because in California, if you offer homeowners as a company, you have to offer earthquake insurance. And so that's how the, the state uh, let companies come up with the California Earthquake Authority, and so that's who we go through for earthquake insurance. But again, it's, it's really important for you folks to just recommend it and then let, let them decide rather than have any documentation saying that you're not recommending it. We'll see, I go to Cousin Guido for that loan. <laughs> At 18%, I don't know. Okay. Richard, does the Fed rate affect the interest rates? This is something that I think is the biggest misnomer when it comes to the Fed rate. The Fed did cut the rates by a quarter just recently. They're looking at cutting rates again by maybe another quarter coming up here. And right away, everybody, well, the rates cut, so interest rates are down by a quarter, right? No. It depends what the bond market does. How the bond market reacts is going to determine how our rates are going to react. If the bond market reacts negatively, we're going to have a rate increase. If the bond market reacts positively, we have a rate decrease. I'd say I get market updates every day. All pretty much this week, we've been getting negative. Negative, 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 which means rates were going up. I finally got a notice today, positive. So a little bit of positive, rates might be coming back down again. The thing is, the bond market will always adjust prior and anticipate to what the Fed may be doing or what the economy may be doing. So it's, it's the biggest misnomer. One of my clients, we were in escrow, we had, you know, everything was locked, the loan was locked. She calls me and says, Richard, they just cut the rate by a quarter, can I cut my rate? No. One, your rate's locked, I can't change it. Two, it doesn't act that way. Just because the Fed cut the rate by a quarter does not really say all of a sudden interest rates are cut by a quarter. So we have to really monitor the bond market. That is the key as to what interest rates are going to do on a daily basis. Thank you, Richard. I have one more question for you, Richard. Once my loan is approved and all conditions have been cleared, how soon can we close? Everybody wants to close fast. Exactly. Where's my docs? 
once all, all conditions have been cleared, we get what, what we call CTC, clear to close. We have to get a CD out, the closing disclosure, and that's part of TRIP. The closing disclosure goes out, we have a three day waiting period. Can't do anything for three days. After the third day, loan docs will go out. That's when we get ready to close, once loan docs go out. We don't fund till loan docs come back, get reviewed, we balance with escrow, we're doing everything to make sure all the funds are correct. So that is when you actually close, not just because, well, all my conditions are clear, why can't I close? You can thank the government for bringing in the Dodd-Frank bill with these new regulations, with TRIB and the CDC, or excuse me, the CFPB, where you gotta go out, you gotta get a CD. Once the CD is done, a three-day waiting period. It's just you can't get away from it. There's waiting periods, so we have to deal with what we have to deal with. Thank you, Richard. Sage, I have just one more question for you. Um, what should I look for in a natural hazard disclosure company? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I believe, I mean, all natural hazard disclosure companies are different. Everyone offers a little something more, a little something less. I think what you should look in a company is trust and honesty, and most of all, if your company identifies you and everyone involved, because the thing is, you need your protection. So look for a company that's going to protect you, your escrow company, your TCs, the broker, look for someone that's gonna protect you, but overall, look for someone that you can trust, regardless of who it is, how long you've known them, do something that you can find trust and loyalty in. Thank you, Sage. And last question, I'm gonna ask the same one. Mark, what should I look for when choosing an insurance agent? Um, this is super important, don't look for rates. Um, you know, because rates can be deceiving, as I told you, as far as in coverage and all that. Agents can play around, insurance agent where rates and low wallets strip down a policy and, and that can get you in trouble. I think, first of all, the, the biggest criteria is, is the insurance agent representing companies that are A superior rated. What that means is that do they have a financial stability to play, pay all their claims in, in the, the, the area? And I know that that doesn't come in, in many people's thought, but that's super important. The second thing is ENO, all right? Does the agent cover, uh, carry ENO for not only himself but his staff and an adequate amount? This is gonna protect you as well as realtors because guess what? If my, myself or my staff say something inaccurately and tells you, your clients that something is covered and it's not, it's covered. All right, even if the policy says it's not covered, it's covered. That falls back on my ENO and on, on the insurance agent's ENO. If the agent, agency owner is not carrying that, you guys are gonna be out of luck and, and they're gonna be pulling both, both the insurance agent and you if you refer the insurance company uh, into a, a litigation lawsuit. And then, do they have adequate licensed staffing? In, in California, in order to speak coverages, uh, a, a staff has to be licensed and so a lot of agents out there use unfortunately unlicensed staff and then they're speaking on coverages and all that and that puts you guys and your clients at risk as well. Do they have bilingual ability? We've, our market has changed. When I was here in 88, you know, basically you never saw any Asian signs anywhere. I mean, and, and you basically didn't even see very many Asians around here. Things have markedly changed, and not only that, many different languages, right? I, when I started my agency, I only needed Spanish staff, and I could handle it. Now we, we have to cover five languages out of our office, just because that's the market we're dealing with. So can they communicate to your, 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 your clients in, in that regards? And then, are they knowledgeable? Not only is the agent knowledgeable, but is the staff knowledgeable? If they keep, have to keep putting you on hold to say, to find out, you know, to answer your questions and all that, guess what? They're not knowledgeable. So if you could just keep those things in mind, you know, you get what you pay for in our industry and, and you know, your clients, this is the most important, biggest asset that, that many of them will purchase in their lifetime. Make sure it's protected well. 
Well, thank you so much. Um, you really answered all of our major concerns and questions. Um, but I will open up to the floor if there's anything that we might have missed. Yeah. I do have questions for Mark for the insurance purpose. Um, many of our home, uh, homeowners who lease out their property in this area has been faced with an epidemic of uh, uh, tenants who <coughs> lease and then illegally grow marijuana on their property, in their property. And, and many of them have vandalism, they have knocked out their walls, and some, some, or some even have mold growth. What can the homeowner do when they found out they've been victimized? Is the insurance company going to cover some of the loss? I, I have not come across that, nor have I heard that, but thanks for not referring those type of clients to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but vandalism is a covered peril uh, on some policies, it's not on others, so there would be coverage on that. One, one of the things that your clients can do to add added protection you know, is for you, for you guys to, to inform your, your landlords to uh, have their clients buy renter's insurance. Unfortunately, renter's insurance doesn't cover liability for illegal activity. And so the vandalism portion of it will be covered if, if it's just that. Um, the mold, unfortunately, many companies have a limitations in, in mold coverage and they cap it at 5,000. Um, when I started my career and back in you know, 10, 20 years ago, there used to be you know, a, a thing out in the industry um, Hopefully not too many lawyers here, but, but it used to be mold is gold, meaning if they found mold, they would go after the policy and, and just sue the heck out of insurance companies. And that's why the companies came back with that. So it has to be as a result of a covered peril, and then the companies come back and, and, and put a cap on mold. So there, unfortunately, is going to be very limited protection, and I would just say that, that you know, try inspections on your tenants. That's a good way to stop it. One question. A question for Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not even a tough question. Um, I just have a question. If a homeowner close escrow, but lease back the property to the seller to live there for another month, what kind of advice do you give to the, to the buyer regarding insurance? I'm going to let James answer that question. <laughs> Just kidding. I can go with the James answer and I'm going to see if you're right. <laughs> He's going to throw it back to me. That's a touchy one. All right, no reward recording. Really, so the least back. What I suggest is to have the, the sellers buy renter's insurance, all right? Because first of all, as soon as they for instance, again, Richard has sold the home, right, on day one, <laughs> leasing it back to me, right, and something happens, all right, his homeowner policy is not going to cover it once he is no longer the owner. It stops at that point, all right? But in order for me to have a little bit of protection on it, I want him to have renter's insurance even if it's a month. Unfortunately, there's not a many companies out there, and I think James can verify, that will offer renter's insurance for a month or whatnot. <laughs> companies aren't in the business of doing that. So you gotta read between the line um, what they have to do. But, um, so it's really important because, you know, I would, they have to have parallel insurance because the homeowner is, is gonna have to protect the structure, you know, and then the, the person doing the rent back needs to have uh, renter's insurance because there are some things that Richard can cause. What what if he causes a fire on the house, right? If you know his his homeowners will, won't protect him for any of that. But if he has a renter's insurance and he's legally liable for that, we can go after that for the policy limits. Thank you. Did you have one? Helen, no. <laughs> I have a question um, for those that bought a condo, a townhouse. How does the, uh, you're talking about maximum coverage insurance on a home, how does that apply toward a, a multi-unit? Uh, well, from a standpoint of, understand that when you guys, I, I didn't want to hog up the time, but all the questions are insurance. Um, <laughs> suppose we have a 20 unit condo, right? And, and we have $5 million on it, you know? 
what the way the condom policies work is that that it's 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 kind of like and, and there could be different ones but it's based on a blanket basis so if it's just your condo burning down they're going to pay for that out of that that five million dollars so you're not going to they're not going to say oh you're you're only limited to a hundred thousand dollars and that's it all right so unfortunately when you're dealing with a master policy you're at the mercy of the policy itself and a lot of times back on the even on earthquake it's if she wants earthquake insurance, but the association doesn't have it, tough luck. She can't buy earthquake insurance on her structure because it's considered a common area. All right, we as association have to decide to buy the earthquake, and and so if she wants it, she better convince the board and all the unit owners to switch and purchase it. Thanks. Thank Question you. adding on to that: Isn't that what the Angel Six walls and coverage is for? The walls, the HO6 walls and coverage is for the interior liability. It's it's only con, it's only covering the the structure that the CCNR indicates that is her responsibility. All right, but if the CCNR says it's common area, even if it's interior walls, then, then that falls back on the master policy. If the CCNR says that hey the the flooring, the window coverings, the the interior cabinets and all that. Are, are her responsibilities, then the HO6 or the separate condo policy kicks into and picks up that dwelling amount or that structure amount. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. How, about, how about the water from the other condo coming to your condo? It? it really depends on, again, how the CCNR reads, but I just ran into a situation last week where the, the lady's washing machine bursted and it destroyed the, the, the neighbor's um, carpeting and all that. And so as long as she has what we call a HO6 policy, it will protect you know, the, the unit owner, all right? For, because it's, 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 it was the person that caused the damage to the neighboring is, is legal liable for, for the destruction. So that is why it's really, really important for you guys when you sell a condo, if there's not a bank involved, they don't have to buy a condo or separate condo or HO6 policy. But I always recommend it because you need interior liability as well as the liability in case, what if I lit a candle and I caused smoke damage and now Sage's condo beside me has smoke damage and all that. I'm gonna be responsible for that. If I have a HO6 policy condo, we will pay for that damage up to the policy limits. In light of time, um, Mark is always here at the affiliate meetings. You can always address them directly. He's really great for answering all our his customers' uh, uh, questions. Sage and Richard are here too, if you want to ask them insurance I, I, I questions. Have, uh, I have a question for Sage. Um, well, I, I have a customer that recently bought a home, and while they went into escrow, then they found out that they were in a um, flood zone. Um, and then they find out that insurance for flood is pretty expensive. It's not a cheap policy. Mm -hmm. Was there something like they could have done to kind of foresee that? Um, well, if you're in California, you're basically probably near a flood, probably on the earthquake fault zone, you're probably in a fire zone. So do you know if it was a special flood zone, if they were like near a dam or no, not that I, I was aware of because it's in the city of Westminster and there's nothing like really like water uh, wash up from the, you know, from the mountains or anything. And at escrow, then they contact me about uh, flood insurance and then... I can answer that too. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the best way I can answer it is if you choose to live in California, you're probably going to have to have flood insurance. You're probably going to have to have earthquake insurance. You're probably going to have to have fire insurance. I mean, I'm not in charge of how much you pay for insurance. I'm here to disclose whether or not you are near a flood. Half the time, you probably are near something. There's special flood zones, such as dams. Typically, it's not going to break, but it's rare. But, you know, natural hazard disasters happen. But if you want to elaborate. <laughs> if you guys know you're not in a flood zone, sometimes these East Coast companies don't recognize that we're not in all flood areas. And so you can challenge that and by, by having them verify if they're in a hazardous flood zones. We've had, had many successes where they're just, they're just blanketing, ordering, hey, you need flood insurance. 
and we find out that, that hey, no, San Gabriel, we don't need flood insurance because it, we're not in a flood area. We can do that, and, and there's some, I, I forgot what, but there's some type of uh, law from the Department of Insurance that prevents them from being able to force your, your insurance from buying flood insurance if they're not in a flood zone. So that can be challenged, okay? Thank you, Sage. Thank you, Martin. How is the flood insurance, if the property is determined, how do they determine that a property is in flood insurance or not? Who determines that? Mark, will answer that Mark question. Or, or, no, actually, it's not determined by us. Um, <laughs> flood zones. I mean, the state of California is the one that updates the maps, but the maps are updated daily. Anything can change. If a dam's there, they could fill in the dam with cement. Anything could happen. So well, who determines that? The government. The map. It's, 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 it's the state. It's each individual yeah. city. It's the state of California that does it. One, okay, we have time for one more question. Does any does any company uh, cover the sewer line? Sure. I'll let James answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> the answer, well, from my understanding, is there's not a company out there that will cover sewer lines. All right, and that includes. Um, I'm not a home warranty specialist, but I've heard them enough that they don't. All right, that's outside the property. And that's a concern of maintenance issue, unfortunately. All right? They won't even cover it. Yeah.